welcome to Wisdom for Life, where we sit through philosophy and find practical advice that you can use in your everyday life. Hi, I'm Dan Hayes, and I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Greg Sadler. Today we're going to talk about... The Venture Brothers, Nihilism, Conflict, and Hope. And so this is a little bit of a departure, but this is something we've been wanting to do for quite a while, because both Dan and I geek out over this really wonderful animated show, and uh, we've got a lot of cool stuff lined up for you. Um, this is going to be a bit different than most of the episodes since we're focusing on a cartoon, which I don't think we've ever done before other than little discussions, perhaps. Yeah, no. And, you know, we are, we are going to try to draw some practical lessons for our everyday life from these um, larger than life figures and mm -hmm. narratives and we're going to bring in some philosophical themes we mentioned nihilism already so we'll have to explain what that is um and i do have to warn you there's going to be spoilers and all the spoilers yeah i mean if somebody wants to complain about that the show has been out for a very long time so i think it's fair game right yeah the last season was what two years ago at least maybe more yeah yeah I think the I, movie's been out for months. I think I watched it during COVID. Does that sound yeah. right? Uh, maybe. Something like that. It's It's been a while. It's been a while that we can't even remember how far a while it is. Exactly, been. yeah. And it's a show that took a long time to drip and drab out, too. You know? Yeah, you get one season every, like, two years. In, in part because, like, it was really run by this, like, two-man crew. Like, you know, obviously... It, there's animators and whatnot, but like only two people were writing it, and and the, the scripts were probably the things that, you know, if you watch the show, you know that, like all the animation was fine, and it's really entertaining, but the the scripts are the oh, soul yeah. of that show. Yeah, and I would say it's got some really great voice work too. Oh you know, yeah, lot lots of interesting talent that gets brought in. So uh, we should, you know, I, for anybody who's wondering, what are these guys talking about <laughs> now? We came here for philosophy. We should probably explain what's the Venture Brothers. So you want to tackle that or? Um, it is a show ostensibly about a family, the Venture family. But and they are, you know, kind of this like mashup between the Hardy Boys and the um Johnny quests of the world, you know, uh, they go on adventures, there's super science, there's, uh, you know, a big burly uh, bodyguard that's going to protect them, but this is, it's, it's really a kind of like a jumping off point into this kind of like this world oh, that yeah. is, um, like, people cosplaying as superheroes and villains, but with very, very meticulous rules, and what it would be like if, like, regular people had um like superpowers and but also were like kind of both narcissists um as well as kind of bad at what they do sometimes a lot of the times <laughs> <laughs> that's true so it's not yeah. like the boys where like they're they're narcissists and they're like evil and and everything's shit it's like it's fun yeah and and so this is a show that ran for a very very long time and it produced a good amount of you could say footage, right? So there's 81 episodes, there's seven seasons, and then there were a couple uh, special episodes that were an hour long, and um, they include the Final pilot movie. in that too. Yeah, and then the movie. I mean, the movie's not like over long too. I think it's about yeah, 90 it, minutes. Yeah, just under. Yeah. And, oh. um, you know, Adult Swim canceled it after the seventh season. It was supposed to have an eighth season. Mm -hmm. And so the movie is sort of a consolation prize, I guess, of trying to wrap everything up. And I, I think they succeeded. I mean, what do you think, having having watched it recently? Absolutely. And, like, I, I see the, the bones there. Like, you know, the whole um, uh, Arch subplot, I think, could have mm. easily taken up a number of episodes. Of that. I think there's a lot of aspects of that, you know, kind of like modern technology taking over this, like, kind of like... Uh, clandestine and very bureaucratic paper pushy um kind of organizations that they run but this is kind of giving far afield yeah so i mean we should say what we mean by that 
term arch because it plays a huge role in the Venture Brothers. So Dan already mentioned that things are rather organized, even bureaucratic in how, and it's kind of funny too. So we would say heroes and villains, but the main villain organization, the Guild of Calamitous Intent, doesn't like that language. They prefer protagonist and antagonist. antagonist. And there's like, I remember actually they they get out the manual at, at one time, maybe in season one, and it's pretty thick. And there's like all these rules about how you're allowed to be the... Um, now, arching is being the arch villain, arch nemesis, arch enemy. That's, that's what it yeah. stands for, right? So you, you get to be... You have to go through like this process and then you're assigned somebody who's close to you in power and prestige for you to be the arch enemy to. And that's like a sign as a hero or protagonist that you've actually made it. You've got somebody to arch you, but they could be at the lowest possible level. I mean, we get, we get to see what level one arch and arches. Brick frog. Yeah, or or uh, what was his name? Uh, Saint Cloud. Um, oh do you, yes. Do you uh, remember his first name? Uh, his only power is he's got lots of money. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's like I buy things. It's like, oh, you wanted that? <laughs> well, I bought it. Yeah, uh, he um, he goes as the cloud, and his his you know weapons are like smoke and. Uh, some sort of zapper gun or something yeah. like that. It's very low. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and then, like, you know, another one is is, is Brick Borog, whose uh, powers are <laughs> wielding brick. a brick yeah. and yelling his name, Brick Frog. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, as you, as you mentioned a little bit earlier, um, it is a series that gets to show us pretty, pretty weak, pathetic characters, as well as, like, super heroic or super scary characters. Um, and you know, as you mentioned, there's like this entire vast narrative universe that spills out of this with all these cool characters who wind up being developed. It's not, I guess you could say it's not like shows where you've got like the team, you know, think about like the super friends. Um, you know, you got Superman, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, who always gets kind of, you know, pushed off to the side, Batman and Robin and who am I leaving out? Um, every once in a while, there's an appearance by like Green Lantern or the Flash, and and you know the other characters don't really matter, other than you know some villains, and the villains are just kind of boring stand-ins. It, it reminds me a lot of like um what the Game of Thrones or Song of Ice. And Fire okay, Thrones, yeah. Where, you know, you've got you've got your your ostensive protagonist, like the Stark family, and whatnot, but then you you are for large periods of time spending time with these other characters that are main characters in and of themselves to their own stories. Right. And it's not this like good guys and you're only in their first person view, but you're, you're constantly shifting perspectives. And, um, you know, there's, here's now an episode about, uh, the monarch and, you know, it might not have even been being him like doing his arching thing against venture. He might be doing this other thing with like, um, one of his other storylines with like, uh, Cato and the, um, the Oh, green. Um, yeah, where he's green yeah, the, green the blue morpho, the blue morpho, blue yeah, Morpho. modeled yeah. after Green Hornet. That's yes, right. yeah, yeah, and with the with Kato in, in tow or Gary <laughs> this place, yeah, yeah, or I mean the rivalry between him and Phantom Limb, you know, oh yeah, um, which ends up getting him arrested, uh, yeah. tried and and put in prison by the end of the first oh, season. Yeah. And then there's a whole like him breaking out and and regaining his like mantle as monarch and whatnot. Yeah. I mean, that was one of the really great things about the show is you you could say that the Venture brothers remain front and center, but there's so many other interesting developed characters, some of whom are villains, some of whom are heroes, and some are just kind of like in between, um, like, you know, conjectural technologies, Pete yeah, White. Yeah, Pete, Pete White and uh, Billy, po- Biz- Billy Quizboy. Yeah. So... And and they we find out about all their backstories and their rivalries and and it's and it's fed to us in the right way. It's not like they're like and now we will do a show on, you know, this thing. We get we get bits and pieces of it, and you kind of have to put it all together. And they've got a really interesting way of doing their narrative. Um, 
Like you always get to the end of the episode right before the credits. Right. And it always feels really unfinished. Like there's there's something that happened in the episode that's like in no stories they would wrap up this portion of this a story with a nice little bow and you'd feel nice and good. But they're like, ah, that is secondary to the characters. The characters are the most important here, though the plot lines are like, you know that Brock's gonna beat up the guy or whatever, like and anything that like should be just expected happens um, yeah but yeah always watch after the credits because there's always an extra scene sometimes it will help to wrap up things and sometimes it's it's just another good joke and uh never never miss out on that i like what you said about it's really about the characters and so coming back to this theme of nihilism if we're worried about like the really big picture then it's it's whether we're talking about the Venture Brothers or we're talking about other things, sometimes we can fall into a kind of nihilistic frame of mind where we're like, so nihilism, you know, it means a number of different things, but one thing you can say, there's ultimately no meaning in life. We can have local meaning, but we can't have like, we can't have the real nice wrap everything up together kind of meaning and you know you look at the storylines of these people so every organization is a failure um, nobody really gets what they want for more than a certain amount of time I mean the monarch gets uh, you know uh, whatever we want to call her uh, doctor girlfriend misses the monarch you know but there's always wrinkles in it mm -hmm. and um, Rusty never gets to meet his his father and sort of like, you know, settle scores with him in any useful way. I mean, he does find his father stuck in uh, the computer matrix yeah. at, a, at a certain point, right? And then there's that alien who pretends to be his father. And he gets Ignore all mad. me. Yeah, he gets all mad at, at him. Um, and, but, you know, when we think about it in terms of the characters, that's where we get a kind of hope. So you can't have super big picture grand narrative meaning anymore because that always collapses but you can have local um this is good enough you know we'll we'll live with this kind of meaning you could say which might you know i mean if there's a grand message maybe that's that that's all you get yeah, it's you know it really comes back to the the characters and the relationships between them, and yeah, if you, yeah. you know, especially as as you we get to the end of the se uh, series, it really does focus on those families and the the creations of them. Uh, it, even though most of them are like these mixed families, these blended families, or these chosen families, um, yeah. And and if there's any meaning to be derived from the Venture Brothers universe, is it's that's the thing that you can you know base your meaning around that be your locus you know part of what happens too is as the characters let's say age or mature they're able to at least with some of them get over their hatred their rivalry their conflicts with each other and be like ah I still don't like you but um you know, I don't have to be motivated completely by destroying you anymore. The the exception being the monarch, of course. But with him, it's um, there's a in in the end of the movie. Let me see what you think about this. Okay. It's a it's a existential reaffirmation of his hatred, which now turns out to be something not just psychological, but even genetic, because he's got right. that baboon DNA built into <laughs> his system. And baboons are pretty nasty creatures, you know. Well, as well as he's got you know Jonas in there, and he's kind of a oh yeah, just terrible person. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> just a dick bag. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he he reaffirms that, but it's something that he's done at other points. Like, there's actually this great scene. I don't remember if this is in the first season, where the monarch, who's you know Doctor Venture's self-proclaimed arch enemy, uh, Doctor Venture doesn't take him that seriously. He he steals with um, Sheila, his his gr doctor girlfriend, into Doctor Venture's lab, and he's like, "Let's let's wreck stuff and all that." And then he's looking around, and he's like, "Ah, oh, this is pathetic." You know, he's not really a. <laughs> super scientist at all this is really sad and mm -hmm. then you know she 
She's like, should we just go home, honey? And then somebody comes in the lab, and I don't remember who it is, and then the monarch gets out his his little shooting gun from on, on his wrist, and he shoots the person full of darts. And now he's, like, reinvigorated. He's ready to fight, you know? That's, like, the whole meaning of his existence. And <laughs> it, it, it really is. And it's really in, like, this um, grand... Um, conflict with like the guild because the guild is, right. is constantly holding him back and so like the we should the say who the guild are because I, people oh, who haven't watched this they're, we, they're we, we talked a little bit this. but so yeah. i'll get to this. so the, the guild of calamitous intent is a an organization by which there is organized violence or um, arching uh against mayhem the there's another word they use <laughs> yes organized mayhem um and so it's it's a uh, a set of doctrines set down by it was the friendship agreement. And if it's uh, like, like the last season, season seven, it's, um, Oh, I just wrote it down here. Um, well, it goes a, back a, whole, a long ways. And, and, uh, one of the yeah. venture pro, uh, progenitors is a member of it until he leaves. Right. right? So, uh, Dr. Ventures, Russie Ventures, grandfather is, was a, a member of it. And then his father, Jonas Venture uh, was the one that um, helped broker the friendship accords, which set down the rules, the giant rule book that you were talking about right, earlier. Right. And then in season seven, they re up the friendship accords back at the, the destroyed Venture compound. That's right. Yeah. And so the guild is the bad guys. Although interestingly, there's there's we find out there's a time period where the guild sort of like in Star Wars they believed the Sith were gone. Um everybody believed that the guild had di- f- finally vanished and they're instead they're fighting Sphinx, which is sort of yeah. like Cobra in GI Joe. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and they it have is, it is, it's not sort of like it is everything except for the name. Well, Cobra was black themed sphinx sphinx is yellow and and brown themed yeah (laughs) but yeah the sphinx commander like he's got that lispy thing like like cobra commander did you know um so uh the episode from season seven where they do this this friendship thing is the immorta consequence um and uh he says um you know uh, there's this beautiful little um line from Dr. Venture says um, you guys are children. He realizes why they have to have these accords because there's there's these adults who are playing at, you know, being like the, the, the macho uh, really amazing, like uh, spies and army guys, and then you've got the the, the guys that are playing as, as the, uh, the villains. Nefarious. Are, yeah. yeah, nefarious. And and you have to have some rules in place, otherwise it's just going to be mayhem. And if you didn't have that, you'd have like all like uh, a level ten arch, you know, uh, going after a, a level one super scientist, and and you see that with the monarch where he's just like offing them, right, um, right, at one season. It's like you have to have some sort of semblance of fair play, otherwise this whole thing it just ends. You you arch, and then you you one of you dies, and then None of you can continue playing the game. You know what else we kind of find out, too, as they move from like place to place, is there's always some local organization or order or something like that. When they go to New York, for example, I forget the name of it, but there's like it's essentially almost like a protection racket of, of superheroes. It, um, it, it pretends to be like the uh, the Justice League. That's right, yeah, but it's got a guy <laughs> who's an archer and just as useless as Hawkeye is. Oh, his name is the Fallen Archer. That's right. One of my favorite puns in the entire show. <laughs> yeah, and, and he then, shoots little arrows that have little feet in the end of them. It is is masterful. Their leader is is a sort of Captain America type. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, uh, Stars and Garters. That's right. Yeah, and then what was the name of the Oriana? Yeah, she's a Wonder Woman type, except she rides um, a chariot pulled by swans, is it? Mm -hmm. Or geese, maybe. Close enough. Yeah, but she's got the lasso, you know, she's very tough. But, I mean, they're a local part of the order. And then, like, Canada has its own... The um, Uh, the PP. um, uh, Yeah, what did they stand? The Peril Partnership. 
apparel partnership. Right? Yeah. So yeah. there's all sorts <laughs> of other organizations. Um, for a while, some of the OSI guys take over Sphinx and, and use the old Sphinx stuff to go do whatever they want to do, you know. So there's a lot of different, we could say not just moving parts, but moving relationships and organizations in the whole thing. Right. And, uh, during this, the second friendship, co uh, conference, um, that we were just talking about here, it, it was, I had this strong feeling of, um, like, a uh, an ecumenical meeting within the Catholic Church, or like post World oh, okay. War One, what is the um, Versailles Treaty? Yeah, yeah. Of them sitting down in a room, and we're just like, we are going to determine to, like what is what is canon and not. And we're yeah, going to yeah. determine like what the rules are and where the boundaries are, and you all have to like do that. It, it just it, it had this great parallel of, um, we look at these guys, these uh. Heroes are, are, and are these and, uh, protagonists and antagonists and the whole like scheme that they're making. They are they are creating this from whole cloth. And once again, this is kind of like that whole um, you know nihilism. But now you have to build it from yourself because it's not out there. You have to build it for yourself. Yeah, yeah. Um, so kind of uh, making this existential leap here. Um, uh, but that a lot of the things that we build in our own world could be seen as just as silly. You know, think of like people buying soccer clubs and the like yeah. uh or any sort of like sports teams and like, okay, well I got this and, and I'm gonna like try to position myself here and then we're gonna go and like make the rules for how everyone has to engage and like, oh, you know, this guy's too tall or like you can't do like the sky hook anymore because you know otherwise like Wilt Chamberlain totally dominates everyone. Like it's it's these these fictions that it's people it's get funny into little rooms that you mentioned up. sports because I've seen you know how like people wear their teams jerseys and stuff like that. I've seen that described as geek cosplay. Mm. You know, absolutely, absolutely, or not not geek jock cosplay. Jock cosplay. Yeah, yeah. The, the geeks you know dress up in their D and D stuff or as superheroes or pick whatever else you want. And that is no more silly than, as I often do, you know, putting on a Packer jersey. Right. So, and and if you go outside of the area of like you know uh, sports or anything, like this is also like you can make parallels to how we run governments. It's like you know, well, the, or, or corporations. Like these are fictions that we have created. They're human constructions, and a lot of the things that we do, especially in like protocol. W from an outside observer, would seem to be yeah, yeah. petty and, and and outside of any reason to actually exist. Yeah, it's. I mean, this is a total side note, but I'm often just struck by the. You know, you see these people who have like billions and billions of dollars and own gigantic corporations and the stupid decisions that they make and you're like you got so much money and you couldn't hire somebody to like help you make a good decision in terms of like you know their public declarations or pr or you know uh, the products that they're bringing out you're like couldn't you like just hire a couple people to do some of the thinking for you and and you're like i guess they can't really be smarter than any of the rest of us you know just in certain ways you know yeah like uh, i've i've met quite a few billionaires right now in my life and yeah they're nothing special as far as i've been <laughs> able to ascertain like they made some really lucky bets and they had the resources um but you know most of them are just run of the mill they're yeah maybe you know, a little bit above average in intellect but like if you look at the the breakdown of people who are the richest it's not the smartest um you got to be even like the people that you would think would be the smartest. So in academia, right, we've got this distinction between like the elite universities, mm -hmm. Harvard, MIT, stuff like that, and then everybody else, right? Mm -hmm. I've met a lot of people from these elite universities, what students, professors, people who've graduated from them. They're not any smarter than the rest of us. They're just better connected and they, they have a lot of, you know, assets that we don't we don't have and they they knew to go to those places because you mm -hmm. know maybe they had parents that went there or something like that and it's it's kind of refreshing to see i think for coming back to the nihilism thing i think that some people would find that dismaying though they would be like 
I really need there to be people who really do know what the hell they're doing and think that the world is well managed by these gigantic corporations run by, you know, people with lots of power and prestige and pedigree. Uh, otherwise, there's something wrong with the world, you know, but the, the way it works is, you know, we're all just kind of muddling through. Yeah. There's enough people that are good enough. Exactly. Have, yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, you don't have to have like geniuses everywhere. And also, I don't like the idea of labeling people geniuses. Yeah. Um, but uh, you have to have enough people that are, that do it well enough, have enough like back log of people that are experienced that can help bring the new people up to snuff and have enough like institutional knowledge with policies that make sure you don't make the dumb move. Like, you know, more than half the game is just not making the wrong move. Not that you have to make right moves. Just don't do something that's going to set you back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. And, and a lot of people can't resist making the wrong move. You know, it's part oh. of what we call hubris, right? Yeah. But, you know, we should we should move on oh, to, 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 to something. Um, so we'll come back to who the Venture Brothers actually are. But one of the things we wanted to talk about are favorite characters. Because we got, you know, I put out a call in social media. What, what would you like us to talk about? And so people said, yeah, well, who are your, who's your favorite character? And I thought I was like, oh, man, that's tough. I don't have a single favorite character. And even coming up with, like, my top three, I'm finding rather difficult. But I thought three might be more manageable. So do you want to go first with who you're – or do you want to go back and forth? Well, let's swapping? Go back and forth. Okay. okay. Well, who, so, so who's your favorite? Uh, like, first one on my list here. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Orpheus. Oh, interesting. This, um, he's, he's uh, trying to be a good dad. He's yeah. the, want, he wants to get an arch. He's over the top. He's uh, a Dr. Strange-like character, but uh, he lives in the, the, the mother-in-law suite at the Venture Compound. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Because he's divorced. Because yeah. somebody seduced his wife. And yeah. his wife ran off with him. Um, so he's kind of, you know, dealing with that as well. Yeah. But I think you're right. He is a genuinely good guy. Like, way better yeah, than Dr. Venture. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. You know, we'll, we'll stop at any moment to help boys whenever they need. Um, just, and he's he's over the top in just the way that I like people to be over the top. So the person that I'm going to pick first is a villain. And how can you not like him? The Mighty Monarch, uh, a.k.a. Blue Morpho, you know, a.k.a. AKA Malcolm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's he's I mean, some people have actually argued that he is the main character, that Do that Dr. Venture is not the main character, that if anybody well, deserves to be called it, it's it's the monarch. I think he's he's actually got the most lines, you know. It is called the Venture Brothers, and you know, once again, we're going to hit that spoiler. Um, yeah, Doctor Venture and Malcolm, the Monarch, his arch enemy, is his almost exact clone. Yeah, you know, they're 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 blood relatives. They are literal brothers. Um, there there is another also uh, JJ, but um. Oh, no, no. there was there was that scene where uh, Rusty Venture, Doctor Venture, is dressed up in the blue Morpho costume that um, the Monarch has been wearing, and he's got oh, the, just the right beard, and right. because he's got the hat on, you can't tell that he's balding. Uh huh. And it's, it's exact match. His, his own wife takes him as being um, that guy. You're right. Um, and so like. It starts off, and you think the story, the Venture Brothers, the titular Venture Brothers, are Hank and Dean, and really, it's it's at least those two. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk about that, or do you, should we should we continue on with well, our? Let's three? go on. Well, we can okay, yeah, there. we'll come back to that. So, okay. who's who's your number two then? Uh, sure leave. He. Oh, interesting. He he just. Uh, you gotta say who he is because I think people okay. So, sure leave is, is part of the OSI. He is on. Oh, I don't know if he's more modeled on a G.I. Joe Navy guy or I think like, so. Yeah, but uh, it's like that plus the cross with the the um, uh, village people. Uh, yeah, right. The village people sailor. 
he's he's buff, he's absolutely in charge, and he's flaming gay. Yeah, um, uh, and he he loves it, and and uh, he absolutely owns it, and he uh, just is a great friend. He's an incredible combatant, and just every every single line is just dripping with gold. Yeah, I, I think he, he, he really is a, a, a great character. Um I mean number the number two one for me, Brock Sampson. Ah. I mean how again, how can you not have him in there? He's you know, at the very start, he was my absolutely favorite character. Um and he does have, you know, a lot of growth arcs and stuff like that. He's he's essentially a brute. They call him the uh Swedish killing machine, right? Because he's this hulking guy voiced by Patrick Warburton. Um he just like beats the crap out of everybody. He won't use a gun because he much prefers to use his hands or a knife, you know. He's it's just so over the top, you know. Yeah, but he, he, I mean, he goes so, through some tough times. Oh, you know? absolutely. Um, you know, uh, love and loss, and uh, you know, wounds and heavy hunter uh, helper embedded in his chest for oh, a while. Right, <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so uh, who is who's your third choice? Doctor Henry Killinger. Oh wow! You you had some really like I wouldn't have predicted these at all. These are deep cuts. He so, he's a really cool character. So he he's modeled on Henry Kissinger. The but um, he's not evil. <laughs> no, he's evil, but he is lawful evil. Okay. <laughs> um, and and he really shows out like you know he at one point in time he he tries to tempt. Um, Dr. Venture into being a villain. That's an absolutely amazing episode. Oh, right. Um, and then he also, like, there's um, these other villains, the accountants, who are, are there's always this, like, this push and pull between, like, um, we talked about the, the guild being this, like, bureaucracy that kind of holds the, the whole uh, artifice together so that it doesn't, like, devolve into chaos yeah and they wanted to destroy that and so henry killinger comes out and like darth vader is them on um, like literally they have a big like lightsaber battle it's, yeah it's, it's and, and he's like he's evil um very affable he's like mary poppins um he flies <laughs> in with a, <laughs> umbrella, An umbrella yeah. and he has a, a murder mystery bag this little <laughs> doctor's right. bag um just a lovely out there character like Kissinger, I have no love for, uh, but I do have love for Killinger. Yeah, I would say the one, the other person who I I really really like is um, one of the few female characters that we've talked about. Starts out as Doctor Girlfriend, turns out she's got a backstory as Queen Etheria, and um, what was it that she, when she had the Moppets, uh, Lady Opair, oh. and then she. Oh, yeah becomes Dr. Girlfriend and then eventually becomes Dr. Mrs. The Monarch. <laughs> and she she is um, you know, she becomes part of the new Council of Thirteen for the Guild after this big bloodletting that goes on. And she's a badass. Absolutely. And she is um she's the one person the monarch is actually afraid of, although he loves her too, right? Yeah. And um She's she's the force of order within the guild, and she's got this loose cannon husband who is going off and doing stuff he's not supposed to be doing while she's trying to like reorganize this entire world of of or of you know antagonism and, and evil. And um she's they're, they're they're opposites in lots of ways. The monarch and, and the, Mrs. The Doctor monarch? Or? Yeah, in part of, like, he is that, that pure hatred, and she loves him for it. But right, she's right. also very much this order, uh, like, in bureaucracy incarnate. And there, it's, there's that, that push and pull between them. Um, like, they, they absolutely love each other. They are totally devoted. Like, there, there's, yeah. that's a great love story. Yeah. I mean, and, and she will do anything for him but she's also often quite pissed off at him. <laughs> <You know? laughs> there's Absolutely. there's actually a great episode before they get get married where i think they're engaged at the time and the monarch's henchmen who are just a bunch of screw-ups manage to capture not only the boys but also brock samson 
and maybe uh, also Dr. Venture, and they've got him in holding cells. And she uh, she comes in and she's like, I can't believe that you're arching him, that you're doing this. <laughs> and he's like, oh, no, no, no. The boys just wanted to see the inside of the cell. You know, they're actually here for the party. You know, and then he's like, you guys got to play along with this. And, and they're all like, yeah, yeah, okay, whatever, you know. <laughs> so... Yeah. So um, sh- should we talk about who the, the Venture Brothers well, actually really are? Really quick, I have okay. a, a, um, a couple of honorable mentions. Oh, okay. Not so much that I love their characters, but I'm a sucker for puns. And I couldn't go out without saying oh. um, Wide Whale. Yeah. Um, who is a whale who wears corduroy. <laughs> um, fallen Archer. He's an archer that yep. has little fallen foot arches. Um, Phantom Limb. Um, he's a right. villain that has no <laughs> limbs, or at least no visible limbs. Um, copycat. He's a uh, a, a 1920s like a James Dean cat type guy. Yeah. Um, but uh, he can copy himself. He multiplies himself. Um, think Tank. He's a, a, a professor. <laughs> right. Has a giant head and then rides around in a little tank. Um, and and orangutan. Who's yeah. A man half angry orangutan. Yeah, those those. I mean, they do. They have got a ton of great puns, and I, we should say one other character who, sh- if we're going to do honorable mentions, like maybe crowd favorites, Gary. Oh, Gary, you know, yeah. who's henchman twenty one, also Sphinx commander for a while. Uh, what else? He he is uh, um, Kano uh, along with the Blue yeah. Monarch. So he wears a lot of masks, and he has like this crazy, crazy arc as well. You know, <laughs> he, he starts off. I think he, he starts off. He got like kidnapped by them at fifteen. Like I was yep. rewatching the first season, and like, and then he turns into um, a uh, a badass as um, as capable as Brock by the end. That's that's another thing. I mean, there's this scene where um, he's at the venture. The venture compound is having a yard sale of mm-hmm. like technology, and he finds a lightsaber. And he's a Star Wars nerd, right? Uh-huh. And so he like he, he thinks he has a real lightsaber, and he goes up to Brock Samson, and he like you know tries to cut him with it, and it, it doesn't work because it's not a real lightsaber. And then Brock Samson basically like says boo to him, and he run he has, takes off, right? Um, but there is that scene where he goes toe to toe with Brock Samson, and neither of them win, right? So and, and it's. It is totally like earned. Like you see his development from that's this right, kind of yeah. pudgy, totally useless henchman to uh, more and more competent to the point where you know he can go toe to toe. He probably is one of the people who has the biggest arc. Like like you're saying, it is something that he does on the way. There's no like, and then he got bit by a radioactive spider. It's he does all the work required for it. And at the very end of season seven. He and the monarch go through this crazy initiation thing, and they both Very, emerge. Uh, Masonic. Yeah, they both emerge as level ten villains, and he's no longer a henchman. He's he's equal to the monarch, mm-hmm. which is kind of cool. Yeah. Uh so what was the next? Oh well, we we're gonna we we're gonna go back to who the actual Venture Brothers are. Uh-huh. You mentioned yeah. so Hank and Dean at the start. You're like, okay, this is the Venture Brothers, right? Because right. they're always doing go team Venture, holding yeah. their fingers out, <laughs> and it turns out that they're actually clones. That you know, who knows how many of them have died over the the years. And there's even a misshapen clone of Dean around. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we find out, you know, that Thaddeus Venture has this twin that he absorbed in the womb, uh, Jonas, Gentur- Jonas Venture Jr., who escapes. And he, at first they think he's a tumor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they realize that uh, Rusty had ate him in utero. Yeah. And he's, and and he's it, a good guy, you know. Well, uh, he, he is everything that you had hoped that his father was. Like the the veneer that his father was, you know, Jonas Venture, yeah, um, who's a terrible, terrible father, on um, and womanizer, kind of a bad human. yeah, yeah. Um, although uh, one of the worst things I thought he did was was retconned out. Well, not retconned. It was uh, at the very end. Like they say that um, he never actually um, had an affair with the Blue Morpho's wife, right? 
Um, and and I thought he did. Like I, it's like that was totally. I thought it was yep. his character, but no, he was actually a good friend to him. And he and he, they couldn't have conceived, and they gave him, uh, <laughs> Malcolm. Yeah. So uh, then we get another wrinkle. We have Dermot, mm-hmm. and at first. Uh, we're led to believe that Dermot is actually Brock Sampson's illegitimate kid because he's kind of beefy and kind of dumb, you know. <laughs> but turns out he's Rusty's kid too. So now there's three Venture Brothers, at least in the let's call it third generation, right? right. Yeah. Um, and there's three in the first or the second. The, the second, second. We got, yeah. We got Jonas. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 We got two sets of three. Well, so now who's the third? And so you got um, JJ, Doctor Venture, and Malcolm. Or yeah. The so we we find out that the monarch is also a clone. Um, that he's got some baboon DNA to. Well, how did they put it to like spice him up or something <laughs> to give him some <laughs> to, drive? Oh, to give him hair. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Two percent baboon DNA. To, yeah. To keep so, the hair. So I guess you could say we have six Venture brothers total, yes, right? At least, yeah. Yeah. Because once again, you have the, the other clones, and there's that one that's misshapen and it's still around. And um, I think he dies, though, doesn't he? Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, so so does Jonas. So. Right. Um, but we got lots of brothers. But, like, the, the main yeah. one, the main the main ones you think are just, you know, two. And then you figure out there's this another set of two. And now it's actually three and three that are the main characters around. So, I mean, I like that ambiguity. Um, we don't know who who exactly counts as a venture brother. Um, part of it is, as you pointed out, this incredibly important role, the theme of family. Um, who who counts as family? Who doesn't? You know, because they. It seems to be that um, Rusty is maybe and Malcolm might be direct clones of uh, Jonas, their father. Um, oh. And that Dean seems to be a direct clone of Rusty, um, but, but Hank, Hank doesn't Hank seem is to be. Not because interesting. I believe, um, Hank is the he got. I believe it's implied that they got uh, eggs from um, oh, what was the the villain in the uh, the movie there? Um, oh, the invisible lady. Um, yeah, uh, Mrs. She becomes Mrs. M- Major, right? She's yeah. married to Force Major. Um, but no, her her daughter, right? Um, yeah, I should know this, but I mean, maybe he takes more after his mom than he does that side. Um, mm-hmm. But you're right, yeah. I mean, a blonde blonde kid like that, and then Dermot doesn't look anything like them either. You know? Well, I think Dermot was like the tryst. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, and and Hank has sex with that same. Oh God, same yeah. that's where he loses his virginity, which then he is uh, forced to forget about. You know, <laughs> yeah, um, failure. So, okay, so but quickly, so failure. Like we're talking about oh, the yeah, show yeah. and how it, it's a little bit like the, a big theme is failure, but they do fail a lot. But yeah. failure is has two major uses with the show. One is it's hilarious. Like seeing people fail in really <laughs> embarrassing ways is like inherently funny. Yeah, uh, that's true. Oh, uh, it's, it's all like schadenfreude, right? Especially because like, like rusty Dr. Venture is kind of a, a bad person. So it's like, you know, look at, it's always sunny in Philadelphia or even like Seinfeld. It's like, it feels good to kind of laugh at these people that are kind of bad people. Right. Um, and, but, also, failure is a path for for growth, and you see this that oftentimes Rusty uh, uh, and the, the team will fail into what seems to be a a hole that they can't get out of, which then turns into something that will actually be of great use and actually beneficial. Well, and and not just them. I mean, the monarch does that too, winding up in prison, right? Um, figuring out how to get himself out of that. Uh, the cocoon gets destroyed. He's got to like rebuild from scratch. He's got to start over in his parents' old house in uh, some New crappy Jersey. part of New Jersey. Hoboken, <laughs> I want to say. Yeah, some some slummy area, you know. Um, and, and yet he... he 
keeps on, you know, he runs up through his trust fund, right? So now he's got to figure out where he's going to get money from. Um, runs out of eyebrow wax at a certain point. <laughs> oh, the poofy eyebrows. Yeah. So, and um, I mean, who else is like learning from their failures in this? Um, I mean, Hunter Gathers, mm-hmm. right? Would Based on Hunter S. Thompson. Yeah. Who he's a really interesting character. I mean, he's the one who grooms Brock for the OSI. He and Brock are the only ones who sort of like X Files kind of stuff. They they're the only ones who believe the guild is still out there, um, and uh, eventually they both become important operatives. But Hunter Gathers goes undercover, has a sex change to do so, which he really wants. You know, uh, joining was the Blackhearts. Um, that he, Molotov that right. cocktail started uh, mm-hmm. um, uh, a, a mercenary group of women, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot of interesting learning from failure. Now we we took some excerpts because this has been so well documented from what um, the the writers actually had to say and um, Doc Hammer and Jackson Public. Yeah. Uh, so early on, they were saying, yeah, failure is what the Venture Brothers is all about. Beautiful, sublime failure. Um, you know, the show is actually all about failure, even in the design. Everything's supposed to be kind of the death of the space age dream world. But then they changed their minds about it a bit later because I, I guess it got kind of done to death. You know, I, I suppose yeah. you go to enough conventions and people are like, oh, man, the show's about failure. You're probably going to push back on it, right? There's only so much deconstruction and, and uh, of a superhero they can do by making them fail to the point where you're like, well, now what do you do? You have to like you've deconstructed to the ground, so you have to build something new. <laughs> yeah. So what comes after failure then? For, for growth, them? rebuild. You know, like you know, we've been talking about it a little bit. Like you know, um, the ventures are are constantly on the brink of of bankruptcy and they always you know, oh, right. find something at the end to like you know bail them out um even when they finally like lose everything um they like uh jj dies and bequeaths them all the stuff and so you know i was like oh that saved them um and and actually like they actually produce like you know really good things like you know um in in the later seasons, we have Doctor Venture, who's been you know riding on the laurels of his father, right. uh, hasn't made anything new. Actually, makes a couple of really incredible things, like of the teleporter. Um, and That's then true, actually, yeah. And then in the very end, um, they're uh, they make these like um, uh, iPod or AirPod like devices. Um, they're they're way over engineered. They're not going to actually probably sell especially for the price that they want that they need to to you know cover the cost of making them but they figure out that they've actually made a anti-gravity drive and that's going to be actually incredibly useful what were those called do you remember offhand it was uh, the, like the a rusty helper, something right or oh no uh, you're right it was bottled after helper yeah and then they have oh something helper or help or something yeah it looks it looks sort of like an alexa yeah uh, Except it's Helper's head. Um, and Helper's yeah. their robot helper. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and Helper's a funny robot, too. I mean, oh, he gets je- super, super jealous of other robots. <laughs> <laughs> to, to a murderous level. <laughs> yeah, he pushes one of them off the venture <laughs> compound. <laughs> yeah. But coming back to this failure thing, so... Um, Public said, uh, I think you and I are both sick of every interview mentioning it's a show about failure. I don't think we made a conscious effort to fight that or anything. But every year we push what we do as a writer, at, as writers a bit more. Um, an area we hadn't gone into very much was positivity. Our victories are all still satiric, but there's definitely places where we said, I want to see these guys do something. I don't want to just have everything fall on its face all the time. And you know, if you think about that, it's sort of like a failure and then getting past failure on a meta level. This like, oh, it's all about failure. And now we're pigeonholed as the mm-hmm. show that's about failure. You know, that's a failing. Right. And so they right. had to figure out a way to get past that, which I think is kind of a cool idea. Uh, definitely. Like, 
you know, when you're young, like your comedy is, is all like a lot of young comedy is sarcasm or like taking the thing or like, fart jokes. Make, yeah, you know, make make it gross, make it like edgy or something. Yeah. It's like, oh yeah, that's funny, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but after a while, you've got to like you got to do something, otherwise, like your sarcasm gets old. Yeah, right? kind of. Um, what is that? What is the the French New Wave in cinema? Um, because there was a whole bunch of these critics, and they're just all they were doing was criticizing um the films, and they're like, okay, well, if you think you're so good, then make your own. You and do they it. did, yeah. And they made some amazing stuff. So, like, you know, if, as long as you don't constantly stay in the criticism and you yeah, actually yeah. eventually build something, I think that's that's a, a great uh, arc to go on. Yeah, you know, um, another animated show that I think you could say has done that a bit, but not maybe to the extent of the Venture Brothers, is Archer. Hmm. You know, I, do you watch that one at all? Or um, I stopped. I don't know when they like were. They got into weird a sci-fi. after a while, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I can see like you know, eventually they actually became at least sort of competent in their job. Like yeah, at the beginning yeah. they were always just like failing. Yeah, and and failing uh, hugely, you could say. Mm-hmm. Well, we should talk about some of the other key themes. Which one do you want to talk about next? Um, I mean, there was the family thing. I don't. Yeah, I, I think I, we should do family. Family is yeah. really. We don't want to um, put that to last because we're getting close to the end of the hour. Yeah. Um, well, let's do a, a masculinity a bit because I think there's some really okay. interesting things in it. And we'll hit family at the end. Um, so we've got this, uh, you know, a whole bunch of different uh, types of masculinity here. And um, we have like our kind of, uh, what, I guess, toxic masculinity or this like very macho masculinity that we could talk about. And Brock really. Um, emphasizes this, and we have um, Doctor Venture, who is this incredibly like <laughs> em- emasculated guy. He's e- emasculated from his his own appearance. He's very like weak and bald, and like um, where's the relatively speed suit? short. Yeah, speed suit. Um, but he's also got this constant inferiority pro- uh, complex from his not feeling like he ever can live up to his father, right. uh, either in a prowess with. Um, you know, women or science or money or anything. Um, and then you have like the boys for these, like, you know, hardy boys, at least in the early seasons, they haven't like developed into like their full characters. Yeah. And you know, somebody else who I would say exemplifies that, that toxic masculinity, but in an old school sense, phantom limb. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. He's so controlling. Very Doc Draper. Yeah. And he's, um, he doesn't take well to rivalry. You know, he sees the monarch as his rival and needs to eliminate him, you know? Right. Which is very outside of, like, the, the whole idea of the guild is to, like, the, the, the guild, oh. Well, like, I mean, you know, Phantom Lim tries to carry out a coup and take over the guild and become the new sovereign. Right. So this is, uh, like, on, uh, you're familiar with Finite, Finite and Infinite Games, which is a book yes, about yes. Um, game theory. Um, and. Uh, a finite game is one where one has to lose and for the other one to win. Um, where an infinite game is a game which the the goal of the game is to keep on playing. And so, right. like, you know, politics in, in part is to keep on winning, uh, to keep on playing. Because if you, like, just, like, destroy them, then you're you're, you're actually going to hurt yourself. Especially, if, like, in politics, if you're like, destroying them, then you're, you're, you're hollowing out yourself. Or you're, the, the whole of your... your country or whatever places um and and he very much is like a, a finite game thing whereas right. you know dr girlfriend is uh and the other people that are trying to keep the bureaucracy is hey we, we keep on wanting to do this forever and ever um and if we like you know go too hard they're gonna like nuke us <laughs> that's right yeah so, you know, we should talk about some of the female characters and, mm-hmm. you know, because you could say, oh, it's a very male centric um, narrative. There's mm-hmm. many more male characters than there are female characters. Um, there's a risk that the female characters could just be props. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think that's actually the case. I mean, doctor, girlfriend, Sheila, whatever, whatever we want to call her, she becomes one of the, the dominant people within the guild and. And one of the most well-rounded characters in the entire series. Yeah, I suppose that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and then it, of them, like Sally Impossible, this is our, 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 um, Invisible what, Girl. Mr. Invisible uh, Girl from the, yeah. the Fantastic Four analog. Except um, all that turns invisible is her skin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which, um, which creeps other people out. Right. Uh, and so, um, she, she starts off as this, like, decoration, just kind of like, you know, uh, the Invisible Woman is kind of like an afterthought a lot in Fantastic Four, especially early, early on. Yeah. And then she, like, like gets rid of um uh, Doctor Impossible um and it's like no like I I'm I'm tired of being that second fiddle that like, that afterthought. It's interesting too because first she goes after Thaddeus Venture Rusty uh-huh. Venture and he just to replace yeah and he is um kind of a jerk to her you know um he he's he is narcissistic he treats her kind of just as a prop and then she winds up with his his twin, um, Jonas, and he really loves her and she really loves him and they're truly happy together, you know? I, I think that's a great character arc. And then we've got, um, you know, Maltov Cocktees, which is like a, like a very James Bondy type villain. That's the reason <laughs> for her. <laughs> yeah. Very um, uncouth name here, but um, she's incredibly competent Russian spy, um, founder of the Black Hearts, and um, Rock is absolutely head over heels yeah. for her. Um, and so she she has her own objectives and is constantly going at them. Is uh, a, a con in conflict with the the, the ventures or Brock himself, um, and is never you know anyone's second fiddle. Um, and it's it's when and she interesting. chooses somebody other than Brock. Brock never oh, gets the girl. She right, chooses uh, Monstroso. Monstroso, yeah, yeah. Uh, I thought that was a really cool twist. Yeah, and then there's also this this idea like we would talk about Brock as being this kind of stereotypical um, man's man, whatnot. He's incredibly buff, and powerful, oh, and he's right, like yeah. suave. Well, I don't know. He's he's rough uh, and suave. I don't know. Uh, what, what, He's what, what, suave what you... in the way that, like, a um, Led Zeppelin fan from the 70s, who he's always playing uh, yeah. in his car, is. Uh, he's a burnout. He, he's, he's got Icarus tattooed on him as well. That's right, yeah. Um, and But he's uh, also incredibly doting, like, surrogate father for the boys that he's... Yeah. he's ostensibly being a bodyguard for them, but he's incredibly kind, spends lots of time with them, um, is is never like really curt with them, as well as he's got like he beds lots of women, but the, the only the ones that really get him and, and get his heart are um these women that could potentially very much hurt him so he's got Wariana, which yep. is this a uh, Wonder Woman analog on um, uh, Maltov as well as um, a uh, another oh a bodyguard, hulking for, bodyguard, yeah, yeah, and and these are the only people that he's like in love with. That's and true, th- yeah. Which is very opposite of what you might w- think in that uh, stereotype. Yeah, and uh, you know, with the Wariana thing, she's got this magic lasso that compels truth, and we find out that she's kinkier than that he is, but he likes it. You know? Oh yeah. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I think he hey. pe- she pegs him. That was, yeah, yeah. We should uh, uh, we should wrap up. We're, we're nearly yeah. at the so, end of our time. We 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 end. You know, we have all these families are chosen, um, and uh, we're going to end with this this quote here from you know the words of the monarch. Venture and I have been engaged in a deadly game of cat and also cat for years.